now the light is on. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? You know, uh, you know, we looked this morning at 1 Peter chapter 1, and we made it down to verse 12. And, you know, we saw in those verses that we looked at this morning that we've got a precious hope. And uh, we saw that we were, uh, we should be obedient to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, Paul, and Peter says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want that peace and we want the grace multiplied in our life. And you know what? We, it's easy to, to increase the size of our body, isn't it? All we need to do is just eat a lot. And we increase like I do, it, and I don't have any problems at all. I've only been down here for two days, and I've already gained two pounds. So I'm <laughs> just pray for me that I don't gain another 20 pounds. But I have been known to do that in two weeks. But you know what? We need to, to grow in the things of God, don't we? And tonight on the outline that I've given you, I didn't give you an outline tonight because I had so many verses I wanted us to think about. And I think what the verses have got to say in the Scripture is far more important than what I've got to say. And, uh, and thank the Lord that I just have the ability to be able to read these verses and apply them in my heart. And that's what we want everybody to do, isn't it? And we'll see a challenge uh, on that concept as we go on. But let's just continue there, and I've only have 32 minutes to finish this message that usually takes me, uh, I usually have to go for an hour and 15 to 20 minutes, regardless of where I'm preaching and what I'm preaching on. But I want us to, to do what we're challenged to do. And you know what, Peter is, we looked this morning at Peter and what a, a man he was as a young man when he was with the Lord Jesus, he thought he could do any and everything. But it took him you know, the Lord going back to heaven and him having to go out and do these works without the Lord Jesus telling him every day exactly what he needed to do, things changed a lot in his life, didn't he? And, uh, you know, uh, we looked this morning, we saw that this book was written in uh, A.D. 65, about 30-some years after the Lord had ascended. And, uh, you know, isn't it amazing how much we can learn in 30 years if we apply ourselves to the Word of God? And I think this ver first verse we want to look at tonight, verse 13 of 1 Peter 1, <clears throat> is a good illustration of what we need to do in order to be able to have a mind at perfect peace with God. Look at what it says there in verse uh, 13. Therefore, based on what we looked at this morning, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the loins of your mind. And you know what that means. You men, we all have a belt, don't we? And what do we do before we go out? We gird up the belt, don't we? We tighten it up and so that uh, we don't have pants on the ground. But we need to do that with our mind, don't we? And what is the thought here? Gird up the loins of your mind. You know, it's amazing. Right now we're doing a, a, a series back home, and Karen and I have watched all the videos, but we're looking at a set of videos how to guard your child's heart. Guard your child's heart. And in each one of the episodes that the, the, the speaker goes through, he shares certain verses that we ought to memorize and have our children memorize so that when they, you know, misbehave or do something that's wrong, they need to, to quote these verses to you. And I know we try, we uh, did this, uh, it's been, uh, uh, what, 25 years, 26 years ago with our son, maybe more longer than that. I can't remember, he's 46 now. But when he was a teenager, we would uh, 
you know, get him to quote verses to us. Go back in your room and find some verses that deals with the issue that you're struggling with and memorize it. And then come out and quote it to us. And it worked. You know what? Gird up the loins of your mind. And I think he's saying, you know, tighten it up and protect what is going in your mind. Because what goes into your mind is going to eventually end up coming into your heart and then it's going to come out of your mouth, isn't it? And so that's why we need to guard what goes inside our ears. And you know, it's amazing. If you take the two ears and put them side by side, they're the symbol of a heart. And what goes in our ears, where does it end up at? It ends up in our heart, doesn't it? And then, out of the heart, the treasures come out of our heart, whatever's in there, and, and it goes into our mouth, and we speak it, and we go out and do it. And so what's the most important thing that we can put in our mind that we want to go down into our hearts? God's Word. It's forever settled in heaven. And we need to gird it up. And, uh, and I think one of the best ways to do that is to read your Bible. You remember the song we used to sing to the kids? Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And that's true, isn't it? And we need to do that. But he says, not only gird up the loins of your mind, you know, strengthen it, and make sure it's not flapping in the wind, because if it does, you'll have all kinds of problems. And you know what? We, our daughter, Lauren, has got type 1 diabetes. She developed at age 38, and she almost died from uh, having it and not knowing what was going on in her life. But we went to a conference together with her on diabetes, and there was a, a seminar there on music. Believe it or not, on music. And they told how that singing these great hymns that we sing, what it does, it makes your blood pressure go down, your body temperature lowers, and your heart rate goes down, and all, all, within just a few minutes, you know, you're calm. Now, isn't that amazing? And they've done studies on, uh, on the blood uh, pressure and so forth, and they have found that they've done choirs where they would take 100 people and put a blood monitor on their uh, arm to be able to, to register their blood pressure. And that choir singing a song about God, within about five minutes, everyone's blood pressure, the heart rate is beating at the exact same rate. Now, that's a miracle, isn't it? <laughs> but we need to gird up the loins of our mind. And he says, and be sober. In other words, the word sober there, it means to be calm and to be collect in our spirit, to calm down. Did you ever have to say that to your kids when they were little? Calm down. Be at peace. Rest with each other. Don't fight with each other. And you know what? When you do that, all of a sudden, you know, they change their behavior, don't they? And that's what the thought being sober is. You know, there's things that we can put in our mind that will destroy our mind, won't it? You know, alcohol, drugs, all kinds of things like that. It will destroy your mind and your ability to reason and to, to think properly. But he says, this is what you ought to do. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What do we need to be thinking about all the time? What is our hope in? You know, if you want to read a good psalm, go read Psalm 39 tonight when you go back home. And uh, Psalm 39 is a psalm of David and his distress, and all the things that he was going through. We won't take time to look at some of those things. But anyway, he talks about he stopped talking. He stopped doing good works. He stopped doing everything that he ought to be doing. And he just shut down completely and wouldn't talk to anybody. And then by the time you get halfway through the chapter, he says, What am I waiting for? 
My hope is in the Lord. <laughs> I don't need to be worried about all of these things that I see around me and all the things that I've done wrong. I need to be trusting God and looking to Him for my hope because that's where my hope needs to rest. And He says, real rest. And we need that rest, don't we? You remember this morning we looked at uh, 1 Peter 1, 1.3 and it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again or born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And you know what? The resurrection was God's stamp of approval. That was God's amen. It is definitely finished. Come up here and sit down beside me. You're going to be the ruler. And you're going to have all of these blessings. And, and that's what we need, isn't it? When he rose from the dead, what was it, 40 days later, he went into heaven. And he's still up there. And we're looking for his coming, aren't we? And when he comes for us, what a blessing that's going to be. You know, he may take us uh, in death, but to be absent from the body is to what? To be present with the Lord. We're going to be with him either way if it's that trumpet sound we hear, his second coming, or whether or not, you know, we, we die. You know, I'm on my extended warranty right now. The warranty is three score and ten, and I'm in three score and ten plus seven. And my extended warranty ends at four score, doesn't it? At the age of 80. But you know what? Paul said it right. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, I'd rather be up there, but as long as I can be used down here, keep me here, Lord. You know, it's interesting. We went to a funeral uh, maybe last year. I can't remember the exact date. I'm showing my age here. Miss Bullen's a, a godly lady who was the grandmother of a young guy that we had the opportunity to disciple for many years. And uh, she was 100 years old. And, and Miss Bullen said, you know what? As long as I can remember who I am and as long as I can serve somebody else, Lord, use me here. Now that's a good thought, isn't it? As long as I can remember who I am and give me some service. And it's so great to be here and to see how many people who has a servant's heart who want to go around and, and serve one another. But this is a good challenge. But look at another challenge in verse 14 there. He says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts in your, as in your ignorance. You know, when we were little children, we did a lot of things and we knew we didn't know what was wrong, did we? And how did we find out that it was wrong? This one mom and dad came and told us, don't do that again. If you do, you're going to get a spanking. And that's when we discovered that it was wrong, didn't we? And, uh, but he said here, as obedient children. You know, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Isn't that what you want? You want your children your, your grandchildren, and there's no greater joy than to see your children, grandchildren, walking in the truth. And, and you know what? It's, it's amazing. What we want to do is we want to see our kids go to the next level, and we want to see their kids to go to the next level, don't we? Increasing, out, outperforming anything that we do. We want them to do it better, don't we? And, and that's what he says here. Be like obedient children. I know we had the opportunity uh, uh, several years ago, about 10 years ago or more, uh, to work with an evangelism team. And we went all over the United States, 44 states, and uh, with good news on the move. You may have heard of that. Okay? And uh, one of the young boys that was on the team came to visit us uh, just recently. He's now working with... Uh, we, uh, the, um, his, he's a, a computer expert with JARS, Jungle Aviation Ministry, 
and all of these missionary planes that fly uh, uh, over the world taking supplies and doing things for missionaries, he has written software that will tell the pilot, you've got to have this much fuel if you've got this much weight and this is how long you can be in the air and all these details that they get. And he's going down there to check out all of the things where it's taking place at and where they're training the missionary aviation pilots. But you know what? He's got two kids. And I can't tell you how great it was to watch those kids be so excited about their dad. And they wanted to hear him say, well done, you cute little boy. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to hear dad to say, well done, you're a good boy. I'm so proud of you. I love you. Keep up the good work. And, uh, and then uh, I was supposed to preach at a church there uh, in Winston-Salem, and so I invited him to take my place. And the, the church, I've been going there for many years, and, and it was amazing when he stood up and preached. Those little boys stood up in the pew, and they were so excited to get to hear Daddy speak. That's an obedient child, isn't it? What do you and I need to be? <laughs> we need to be like an obedient child. That's what God wants, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, isn't it exciting to see these little kids that can run around here and play and scoot under the benches and, and do all this thing? It's got all of these energies. And if you tell them to stop, just like that, they stop. It's great, isn't it? That's what God wants us to be, obedient children. And the way we become obedient children is the things in Scripture we're told to do, we need to do it, don't we? And when we do it, we find that we will not conform ourselves to the former lusts that we did in our ignorance. And that's what we need, the Word of God. And we start off as little kids, and we need to grow up doing it. You know what? I can remember when Karen was pregnant with our first little baby. I could sit in the, in the living room with her and put my hand uh, on her stomach and I could read scriptures to her. And you know what they say? That babies that's unborn can hear the voice of the parents. That's amazing, isn't it? And we've got a doctor here that can confirm that. But let's go on here. As obedient children. And you know there's a couple of verses here that I want us to think about in, in, in the uh, uh, center column. I call them supporting verses. But look there at Ephesians chapter 5, number 2. It says, Therefore be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And that's what we want. We don't want to be stinkers, do we? <laughs> we want a good aroma to come from us. And we do that when we are followers of God as dear children. Daddy, what would you like me to do next? Thy will be done. There's nothing better than that, is it? To hear your children want to obey God. And what a blessing it is. And I can't tell you what, how much of a, what a privilege it is to be to lay your head on the bed at night and know that your children are walking in the Lord and being obedient to Him. And you know, I've prayed many, many prayers for my two kids. Wayne, the missionary with World Venture, a missionary in Africa for six years and, and all the work he's done in Memphis, Tennessee. And Lauren, a missionary with Wycliffe Bible Translator. She's a world uh, librarian, teacher, and trainer. And it's nothing more pleasing to a parent's heart than to see that their children are wanting to serve the Lord. And, and that's how we can put a big smile on our parents' face. It's when they see us following the Lord. But look, there's another one here. Ephesians 5, 8, look at that verse. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, truth, proven what is acceptable to God. 
walk as children of light. You know what? When it's dark outside, and if we've got a flashlight, we don't have people have a problem with people coming around and wanting to be with us, do we? <laughs> and especially if there's, you know, it's it's not a full moon, or if it's a partial moon, and you don't have any sun, a moonlight coming down at night. And but when you're out in the woods, or you're a mile from home, or something like that in the woods, and 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 you know what, and you don't have a light, you can't tell where you're going, can you? But we need to be children who walk as a light bulb. Let your good works do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven and be lights. And we don't have time to look at that verse passage in detail. But that's what we need to do, right? Walk in love. Walk as children of light. But look at what it says in verse 15. Another challenge to us, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And you know what? That's a beautiful illustration of being like our Father, isn't it? He's holy. He's the only absolute holy person. And his son, the Lord Jesus, was the only absolute person that's ever walked the face of this earth. And was absolutely holy. But he said, because the one who called you is holy, you ought to be holy. And you can see many verses that we've been adopted into the family of God. We're children of God. And we ought to act like our Father. We ought to be holy, separated. And that's what the word holy means. And you know what? It's amazing the number of times you find this illustration in the Bible. Look at some verses here in a center column that deals with the, uh, the nation of Israel. He says in, in Leviticus uh, eleven forty four, For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. For I am the Lord who brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Who brought the nation of Israel out of captivity? 490 years of captivity in Egypt. The Lord brought them out, didn't he? But look at another one here. He says in Leviticus 19.2, Speak to all the, ch uh, the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Look at Leviticus 20.26, 20, And you shall be holy to me, for I... The Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Who did the people of Israel belong to? They belonged to God, didn't they? He brought it. He's the one that delivered them from their captivity. Who's the one that delivered you and me from our captivity? The Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't it? And you know what? When he took them out into the wilderness... What did they do? <laughs> did they listen? They rebelled for 40 years. And you know what? God judged that group of people, and everybody, when he judged them, pronounced this judgment on them, that was above 20 years old, they were going to die in the wilderness. And it was the young people that was going to be brought into the promised land of Israel. But... <laughs> It's amazing here. And let's go on here. There's, here's another verse that we can think about. And if, verse 17, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. And that word fear, it just carries the thought of respect. I'm going to respect you, and because I respect you, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. That's the way we need to be, isn't it? And the Father, he, does He show favoritism when He judges our works? He does. He shows no partiality. Do we do that? We do it sometimes, don't we? And you know what? 
Uh, do we show partiality to our kids? We sure do, don't we? If we, if we see our kids, you know, we don't, uh, we don't judge them based each person on their thoughts and the intents of their heart. God's the only one who can do that. But, you know, he says here, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning. You know, we're just the pilgrims passing through, aren't we? And we looked at that uh, this morning in verse 1, that uh, there was a challenge there to the dispersion of the people, the believers, that was taken out because of persecution, and they had to go into these five big cities up in Asia. But look at what it says in verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, when you think about the word redeemed, it's to pay a price, isn't it? It's to pay the price. What was the greatest price that could be paid for anybody? You know, I can't think of anybody that I would be willing to give my son for them who was a sinner. But what did God do? God sent His well-beloved Son here to this earth to die for you and for me. And for all of the sins that we have committed, he paid it with his precious blood, didn't he? You know, it's interesting, uh, one of the verses that you find that's quoted many times, it is finished. And uh, it's interesting, you can look at, the, at some of the concordances and it'll show you the different words, different ways that word is translated. And you know what? It's translated to pay. The debt has been paid. And I could, if we had time, I could show you several verses that deal with that concept. When he said, it's finished, the debt has been paid. I died for your sins. Now I accept, ask you to accept what I did for you as a free gift, and you follow me now. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? And how can we know, say no to somebody that would do that for us? But he says uh, also here uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, it's in the third column over there, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then in 2 Corinthians seven twenty three, you were bought at a price, do not become slaves of men. The greatest price that's ever been paid was paid for our salvation. The one who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God took our sin and put it on Christ. And then when we come and receive him as our Lord and Savior, he takes his righteousness and gives it to us. Does it get any better than that? It doesn't. And we're about out of time, so I'm going to look at these other verses down here at the bottom, and we'll have to skip some of these supporting verses. It says in verse 22, or let me back up here, uh, at verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. God. It's not what I'm doing or what I do. It's what he's done for me. That's what my hope is in. And listen to what it says in verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. 
you know, we, uh, we help purify and cleanse ourselves is by obedient, being obedient to the Word of God. Right? If you want to look at some verses, look at 1 John chapter 1, verse uh, uh, the, the last uh, four or five verses there. It'll give you the different ways. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But listen to what else He says here. Since you've done this, what should be our responsibility? Obeying the truth through the Spirit, and here's how we do it, in sincere love of the brethren. And you know, I think we could say there, for all believers, for everybody, right? You know, we're to love our church family, aren't we? But what, what are we supposed to do to our enemies? We're supposed to love them too, aren't we? Isn't that what God did for us when we were enemies of God? Did Jesus die on a cross for us? And we need to love one another with a pure heart. And you know what? Unless we have that heart that's pure, I don't think we'll do it. But listen to what he says in verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven and it's going to abide forever, isn't it? You know, and if we change anything in the Word of God or we do anything like that, we're, we're, we're fighting against God aren't, God, aren't we? And we're going to end up a liar if we try to change in the Word. But being born again, that's where it starts, isn't it? Receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we're born again by the Spirit, by the Word of God. And it's amazing. If we, I wish we had time to look at all of those, those beautiful illustrations that deals with being born again. But let's just close with these last two verses. It's a beautiful illustration of us and grass compared to the Word of God. Because all flesh is as grass, it says in verse 24, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the gospel by which, uh, this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you the word of God that endures forever it's definitely forever settled in heaven and not one jot and tittle will not be fulfilled the Lord Jesus did that when he was here didn't he he didn't come to destroy the law he came to fulfill it but aren't you thankful that we have the word of God this book it's forever settled in heaven, and we can spend the rest of our lives reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it, and enjoying it in our lives. And it's nothing in the world that will change our minds and the way we think more than the Word of God. And you know, whatever struggle you're having in life, uh, if you want to talk about it, I can show you some verses you can memorize. But first of all, you know, you need to confess that what you're doing is wrong to God. And when you do, and you're sincere about it, that's called repentance. What does God do? He forgives you, doesn't he? Then he wants you to become like a, an obedient child. Being willing to say, Father, what would you have me to do today? Thy will be done in my heart as it is in heaven. And uh, you know what? It's one of those great passages, and I've got many more verses I could have looked at here. But you take this little passage, this little book uh, sheet home, and look at some of these precious promises that's in these verses. The Word of God doesn't get any better. And what's it going to be like in a coming day when we are in heaven? 
our minds will be completely transformed to the image of Christ and we'll be with him and we'll be like him throughout all eternity. What a day that's going to be. Father, we just thank you tonight for your precious word. Father, we come and we admit that we have all come short of your glory. We have not done things according to your will all of our life. But Father, we thank you that you loved us and you sent your perfect son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He was the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. And Father, all we need to do is come and to admit and to repent of our sin and be willing to confess Jesus Christ as our sacrifice for our sins and accept him as our Lord and Savior and start living for him the way you want us to do. And so, Father, we pray tonight, if there's one in our midst that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that tonight would be the night that they would be willing to bow the knee of their heart and confess him as Lord and repent of their sins and to be saved. And so we just commit it all to you tonight, and we thank you for your precious word. And, Father, we thank you now for this time of fellowship we'll be having next door. And we just pray your blessing upon that. And we give you thanks now in that name that's above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.